I don't want to get swept up in a great conversation and then realize like, oh yeah, I was here to talk to him on behalf of people. So that would be a tragic failure of, of attention, I guess. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Go, uh, uh, so maybe uh, you could just share something about yourself and we could go from there to try and let people have a deeper insight into John's work and what's behind it. Definitely like document some of his ideas and, and explore them, especially in relationship to ecologies of practices, um, cultural cognitive grammar, uh, and the meaning crisis, especially like now, like why in 2021 and 2022 has John's viewership tripled and it's growing like, you know, exponentially. And like, I, I wanted to talk to you specifically because I think your unique contribution is how probably influential you've been on a lot of the ideas of the meaning crisis material. And so, I mean, you co-wrote the zombie book and you were in a lot of his first collaborative videos that were on his channel. And mm -hmm. you, I'm imagining, had a lot of impact on a lot of the ideas that are in that 50 hours of content. And then even beyond that, you've done the other series with him, with Greg, and you've done other, like a, a ton of other events. So you have just a very unique perspective that people wouldn't get just by watching his series, for example. Yeah. Okay, no, that makes sense. I might have more questions as we go along, but I think just to begin, that that gives me something to anchor my attention to. Yeah, because I just think you have such a valuable perspective to hear in relationship to the work. I just think, uh, I, I don't know, what it, what was it like for you to see a, uh, the growth over the last decade? Or what was it like 10 years ago talking about these ideas and now seeing yeah. them so popular now? Yeah. That, well, that's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, uh, it's um, it's been very uncanny. I mean, seeing John. I, I mean, John. Even when I met John, John was the object of a lot of admiration and adulation from people. I mean, he was a phenomenal pedagogue when I met him. I, the John that I met when I first met him, like over ten years ago, differs <sighs> all of the fundamentals that that people admire about John now are were intact and present when I met John 10 years ago. I mean, he wasn't, ex he wasn't dramatically different than from the way he is now, except in matters of degree and, and, and subtleties that this probably isn't the best time to talk about anyway. So I think that for all intents and purposes, people are drawn to John from, for a combination of things. One is he's just an impeccable pedagogue. I mean, as a teacher, he has a way of synthesizing information and making arguments from it that's singular. I mean, I've never met someone who does that so um, so cogently and does it so um, in, in such a way that he integrates across domains and produces from the marriage of those domains insights and new territories of possibility and attention that nobody could have imagined. And yet once they're brought to attention seem inevitable and seem recollective. That's the thing about John, right? That's what draws people to him. It's what draws people to all great teachers. People are drawn to teachers who tell them what they already know and give words and give formulation to what they already know in a way that allows them to know it better and more consciously, right? That makes meaning, things that are meaningful, conscious to us that's what john does and he does it he does it because he's a, you know john's a polymath in many ways because he's capacious as a as a as a mind as a thinker and so he because of how versatile he is from one domain of knowledge to another he's able to detect patterns that are very far-reaching and he's able to um he's able to thread the pad to weave patterns together and weave them in a way that's actually quite beautiful it's sort of john's creative capacity is probably undersung you know people understand that he's rigorous and he's argumentatively um very uh, formidable but john has a has a creative dimension to him that um i think is so effective that it's kind of invisible a lot of the time there's a great deal of creativity though he's, he's a theory production machine in a lot of ways right um you know you you i, I joke them sometimes that you sort of put a coin in him you know, you put a coin in him and theory pops out. And, and, and I don't mean that 
superficially, but he, like I said, he has that integrative knack for formulating, taking um, what is presented to him and finding what is most novel about it, what seems to be most operative about it, right? Most true of it and using that as a fulcrum to reshape the meaning of that information and direct it or index it in the direction of something that's more meaningful, right? That's what he does, right? He, he reorders the sequence of why information matters. And it's no, and it's no, I mean, it's no coincidence that his sort of founding theoretical idea of relevance realization is a reflection of exactly that capacity, right? And an elaboration of that capacity to take information and to understand its relevance and to focalize it for its relevance. And so what he does in theory, he doesn't practice, right? John's a fairly integrative person. So that's what draws him is that he's not, academics are pretty fraudulent a lot of the time, you know, they have, they have, um, they, they, they're, they're, their, their character, their disposed relationship to the meaning of their own work is often disjunctive, right? They'll often teach and live in ways that are disjunctive. Um, and people know that. And that's why, you know, that's why you, the university as an enterprise, I think, is not a place of wisdom in the way that maybe it once was and that we all envision it to be is because it's full of people who, um, who have a lot of performative contradictions. And the thing about John is that he is a, he, he's of an older guard than that. He's, there's something profoundly modern and cutting edge about John, but there's also something profoundly, and you know, of antiquity about John, which is to say that for him, the project is whole. It involves the whole of his person. It involves the whole of his relationships. It involves the whole of his being. He dedicates every every last iota of metabolic energy to it. And um, I think a lot of people probably don't realize how much that costs him. But he, he, he dedicates himself in total to that end. And for him, it's a project that integrates all of the dimensions of life, all of the relationships there. And so there's no separation for him between an intellectual vocation, a spiritual vocation, and a moral imperative. They're all the same thing for him. And that's present even in the way when I met him, that was present even in the way he structured his courses. He structured his courses as arguments. I know that he learned that from someone who came before him. I can't remember who that was. Um, I think Gibson. So maybe Gibson's that's that. followers, yeah. Right, that's right, that's right. So, you know, it's not as though maybe that technique was novel to him, but the thing that he did with it is he uses the, arg he used the argumentative format of lecturing as a way to gradually seduce and persuade attention and direct it in the service of something that was far greater in scope and in ambition than it ever alleged to be, right? He always began arguments with very, very humble or modest aims, but then when he actually presented the argument, what, it's very tough to explain this, you know, because when people are, the, the way people are affected by John isn't, I mean, you're probably familiar with the various, his typology of the four kinds of knowing, which I published with him a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, the propositional, the procedural, the perspectival, the participatory, and usually academe um, and, and, and teachers usually operate within just one category of those. And, and John, there's something about John's, um, um, as a John's pedagogy, that involves people. And, and that's what makes it, it and him Socratic, right? It turns people's attention, not simply their intellectual attention, but the attention of their character. It turns them, the whole of them. And maybe that turn is slight as a matter of degree, but I think for many people, the turn is quite profound because what he does is, like I said, he, he takes, you know, we all, we all, we all walk and act on a foundation 
a foundation of belief and a foundation of, of or fundamental orientation that goes unconscious and uncontemplated, I think, for a lot of people. And the thing that John did for his students, and I think still does on a larger scale now, is he takes that foundation and he represents it and he makes it conscious, right? He shows people why they believe what they believe. And by making those beliefs conscious, allows people to turn a contemplative eye toward them, inquire into them properly, and then understand the true, you know, the true consequence, the true scope of, of possible, you know, um, import of, of that foundation. Um, so that he was like that when I met him, you know, and I think the, the, the only difference is now is just the, the audience, the platform, the vehicle, all of those things are dilated. They're all, everything is ratcheted up. Um, and I think now too, one thing I'm very, very happy for him is that, you know, he now has, I mean, I, you know, he was, like I say, admired and, uh, and, and thought very well of and popular as a lecturer when I first met him. But I mean, he was really underappreciated except by the relatively, you know, except by the sort of the, 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 um, the sort of the conclave of students that, that walked within the, those precincts, right? Of like the psychology department or the COGSI program or whatnot. But his great, I, I mean, I cannot think of John as anything but a philosopher. I mean, I know he identifies as a cognitive scientist and people often call him a psychologist, but but that's, I mean, he never calls himself that. That's only because he teaches within a psychology department and he teaches psych courses, but he, he doesn't call himself that. He usually calls himself a cognitive scientist. What makes him um, a philosopher? Like, how is that distinction the most apt well, because title? He's, 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 he's imbued with the Socratic spirit. I mean, he loves, he loves wisdom by the classical etymological definition of philosopher. He is that, he's that as much as anyone, probably more than anyone I've ever met. I mean, think of, you know, watch, watch him as I'm sure obviously you have. So I mean this more generally, right? As an injunction, but like if you watch him in conversations and dialogue, he is moved. He's moved by the beauty of ideas when they redirect his attention and sharpen it to a more adequate formulation of truth in the context of any given encounter. That's what attracts him. That's what drives him. He, he gets, you, I mean, you watch him, he gets excited. He doesn't hide it, right? He's in love with the project that he pursues. He's so deeply in love with it that for him, he does it, he does it at, a, at a level of his being that I think most people probably can't understand. It's just, it's such, such a deep imperative for him. Well, have you ever right? talked to him it's and he's just been so happy that he like changed a student's mind or got to like give a presentation or has he ever just shared one of those moments that's like, he's just such, such a nerd for wisdom or such a, a nerd for teaching and helping people have these kind of like epiphanies or have these rediscoveries of things that they care about. Well, yeah, but that's not, but it, 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 it's, it's not as though those are, are, are occasions that are, that are distinguishable. That's just how he is in general. And I don't, and I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't say it's a matter of nerdiness because nerdiness implies hobbyism and it implies that it's sort of a, it implies that it's an incidental interest that, that, that is, um, it implies that it's some kind of side infatuation. It's not. Yes, it's I see a nerd as a noble soul. So yeah, I didn't mean to imply that it was like a doubt no, no, or mean. a lack of uh, like integrity, but yeah, definitely. No, no, no. I know what you mean. I know what you mean entirely, but, uh, but you know, the, these, these terms sort of conjure different associations. And so um, it's not like it's, he's not doing it because he enjoys himself. He does, but that's not why he does it. The enjoyment, the enjoyment is incidental, I think, for him. The, the pleasure, if I can call it that, is incidental. It's the meaning, right? It's the deep imperative to take responsibility over the project of turning yourself toward what is most true and good and beautiful. He is a Socratic and a Platonist at heart, or a Neoplatonist, maybe it was a bit more accurate to say. And because of that, he is moved. 
he's moved in every sense, intellectually, emotionally, right? In every sense, he's moved in the direction of that project and moved by it. And and um, and it comes it comes it comes before any other consideration for him, right? Like I said, it's something that is it's comprehensive, and that's what makes it real. That's what makes it authentic, you know. So what people are, I think, unconsciously tuning into when they watch him isn't aren't just the movements of a prodigious teacher, though he is, right? Or the the theorizing of a of a formidable intellectual, which he is. What they're attuning to, I think oftentimes without knowing it, is characterological. It's something about him that is turning in the direction and people can't help but to turn with him. And the enthusiasm that he effuses can't be understood independently from that core orientation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not even unconscious because people love his videos on Agape and his uh, uh, yeah. moral elements and his, uh, uh, one of his first videos I saw was on like a similar topic and it's just he, speaks almost poetically about agape and about fellowship and about like you said like you can mm. feel it in in his posture and his uh his body language when he gets really excited about uh a part of beauty or uh, a new idea that someone's bringing up or, or something like that is that maybe what you mean yeah yeah i mean it's funny you mentioned the agape that a lot of people, well, I mean, one of the reasons why his, um, his presentation of agape, both in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, but also in, I mean, iterations of that lecture go back a very, very, very long time. I heard a version of that lecture in 2010 or something that was a forerunner to the one that made its way onto YouTube. And he had been doing it already for at least 10, 15 years before that. So uh, before any of this came online, it was operating within an academy. He, I mean, when you walk into his classroom, I don't mean to say that the university is the academy. It's clearly not. I mean, it's part of the problem. But his class was the academy. You walked in and you were in the academy. And, and he was Socratic in his approach to students. He was always very delicate with them. He was, he was, he managed to be rigor. I mean, he had a bit of an edge when I first met him, actually, more than he does now. And, and he was quite rigorous. And he, and and it was very important to him that you know, I remember when I. It's funny when I, I can't. When I first met him and when I first took his class, um, you know, he had structured it in such a way that there were different kinds of questions that you could ask in the course of a class. Right, one was to seek clarification on a point of maybe a theoretical point just to make sure you understood it before advancing uh and and one was if you wanted to issue a challenge or something like that or you wanted to kind of make a uh, uh, an inquiry into an argument that you had already understood and maybe there were one or two others anyway he had sort of stratified or organized these questions he had a very socratic approach to this process it was dialectical there was something elenkel about it in the socratic tradition and on many occasions i would see him do that he would engage students socratically in real time very rigorously without undermining the integrity of the project and without belittling, right? You know, he would not, I mean, you, he, he, John was not the kind of, I mean, bless him, he was not the kind of instructor that was, was permissive of foolishness simply because he wanted to be nice. He was, he would challenge his students and it was very important to him that if you were to engage with this, you engaged with it rigorously, properly. Um, and that it was not an egoic project. It was a project that happened often in spite of egos. And, but, but he was able to maintain that rigor without ever being um, caustic or you know, abrasive. And that's, again, that's a, that's a rare thing too, because I think a lot of, uh, <laughs> I had some other instructors who were very rigorous, uh, but, but would be, um, but I think, became, you know, the, the only way to, to, to resist the, the pablum, I think that a lot of students are used to was to be abrasive. And, and John man, always managed to walk the line of being rigorous and challenging, Socratically provocative, 
while also making students feel that um, that you know, provided they brought themselves to bear in the spirit of what was being taught, they would always be accepted and invited to do so. And probably the most, you know, John is someone for whom the most apposite and the most elegant idea wins. Wins in the sense of earns attention, earns appreciation. John will happily discard something that he has just said or done if he meets someone who has a formulation that exceeds his or complements it. That's another thing that he gets a lot of attention for, and deservedly so, is the, gen the intellectual generosity. Um, John's, John's published most of his work in partnership with other people. Obviously, I'm one of those people, but there are many, and there were many before me and after me. So, um, John, for John, it's a communal and cooperative project, right? And for him, that goes back to the Socratic Platonic tradition, right? That this project is a fellowship, it's philia, it's communal, that, um, that uh, ideas are, are meant to be shared because the virtue and value of the idea is not as a piece of intellectual property, it is as an instrument for redirecting attention and turning yourself, you know? So again, everything that, is, that people find singular and unique and enthralling about him is, I would say, derived from his central commitment to the Socratic tradition of which he is so exemplary. So question number three in this list is, um, what are the three orders uh, and how does thinking in these terms help someone live a more intelligible and meaningful life? Uh, the three orders. So the three order, I, I assume you're referring to the three orders of worldview attunement or the three yep. orders of, 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 of the three cosmic orders that he talks about in Awakening from the Main Crisis. The nomological, the, um, the normative, um, and the narrative. And this is entirely, I mean, it, John derives these things from all kinds of different sources. So the, the, the seeds of that idea would be impossible for me to trace, although he could do it. Um, but this is profoundly his formulation. I helped him bring it bring it to words, uh, as did Phil, uh, Philip uh, Mistrovich. But, um, but this is John's formulation fundamentally. And this is a way of understanding that our sense of order, our sense of intelligibility and coherence, the way that the world presents to us, the way that it emerges into consciousness and organizes itself into texture and depth and dimension can be understood along the axes of three interlocking dimensions. One being the, the, or, the, uh, the orders of the, I guess we could call them the nomos, the rules or the laws, those things that seem to structure and stratify the, 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 the fundamental tenets of the way things fit together, the way th things work functionally and spatially, right? And that, I think the nomological order, um, I think in that way can be understood in, in terms that are a little bit more Aristotelian because of that, right? Because there's a fund fundamental governing structure to the way that things fit together and present descriptively. That's one way of understanding the nomological order. The narrative order, right? The idea that there is a, uh, a meta-narrative, a, 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 a cosmic story it's not story, not in the kind of the, the trivial sense of what did I do with my day today, but story in the sense of a, a, um, a fundamental cosmic movement in a direction that by us is understood temporally, but that is fundamentally connected to what is eternal, right? So a movement of the cosmos in a direction that uh, that bespeaks its telos, right? Its final cause in Aristotelian terms, right? A, a teleology that moves the cosmos and moves each individual who participates in it in a particular direction in which things culminate into um, their ultimate purposes, right? Um, and, and, 
that's very much bound up with our experience of time. But again, in 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 the ancient world, time right, Plato says that time to Plato characterizes time as the moving it moving image of eternity, right? And, and people like Augustine. Uh, and, and the Christian Neoplatonists kind of refine that idea, I think, even further. This idea that that time is is held in tension by the eternal, right? And that there's a there's a there's a there's a continuity between those things. And so that because so that our experience of time is fundamentally anchored or vectored by a kind of uh, uh, by an object of attention and direction that is the culminating point of of our personal meaning as individuals that participates in a final, more ultimate meaning um, in, in, um, uh, and, and a higher order of, of, of intelligibility. Um, so that's, that's narrative. And then the normative is, it kind of fits bet between the other two, I would say. The normative is this idea that in order to, uh, th th very similar to the narrative order, I would say that this idea that um, that that not only do we possess a kind of natural endowment, um, uh, a kind of that could be talked about, you know, uh, that not only are we are we possessed of certain qualities and a certain nature that is implicit to our existence and that precedes it or constitutes it, but that there's something about that endowment that has to actually be realized or actualized or somehow fulfilled as a consequence of deed of contemplation of some kind of human will or action, right? And this is an idea that is in the ancient world, but that I'll actually, I would say in, in some ways is reborn with the existential tradition, especially that it's more prophetic origins, not so much it's sort of later derivations, but I mean, especially with people like Kierkegaard or, or um, and, 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 and uh, certain and other Christian existentialists, which is, is this idea that, that yes, we are, we are possessed of something innately that we can recollect as the ground of our participation in being and our participation in what is ultimate and truthful, but that participating in that, though it might come naturally to us in some implicit way, nevertheless requires us to bring ourselves to bear on the matter. And that's the idea of the anagoge, right? The ascent of the individual or the theosis of the individual in the, the Neoplatonic tradition has everything to do with the way the person brings reason and contemplation broadly defined to bear on what is already implicit in order to pronounce it, to bring it about, to have it flourish and to realize it, right? So that the, the, the self is something that the person is but must become in order to, to realize their affinity with what is ultimate within them and beyond them simultaneously. Right. So it's this idea that, you know, there's work to do, basically, and that realizing one's place and participation within these orders requires one to turn in the direction of what is already implicit. There's a line from Romeo and Juliet, I think about this a lot, a lot but which is otherwise has no relation to any of this. But there's a really good line that says, you know, now thou art what thou art by art, as well as by nature. And to me, that kind of sums up the idea, right? Which is you take what is implicit, you make it conscious, you make a decision to realize it, which is paradoxical, right? Why would you have to realize something that is already within you innately, right? But that paradox is present, I think, both in that and that in antiquity and, and also present in certain modern strains of thinking. So anyway. <laughs> gone on way too long about that no that sure. was fantastic that was really deep and interesting what you said and and the role of of consciousness as an affordance for its own growth um is is really interesting in what you were saying so there's these these three different intersecting uh cognitive and kind of like personal or interpersonal or historical and then uh, just even so much more all kind of axes in inside of individuals or inside of uh, people, right? Um, yeah, 
Yeah, and it's com- I mean it's complicated. I mean trying to trying to summarize something very complex very quickly, and then you could say that you know that the nomological order is right fund- fundamentally comes out of uh, of Greek thought, uh, of particularly as refined by Aristotle, and you could say that the narrative order is something for- that comes much more out of the Hebrew tradition uh, in terms of you know the, the cyclical form of time versus the linearity of time. I mean there's all kinds of origins to all of these things and, and the way that they operate, but I think it's safest to say that these are these are dimensions of worldview attunement. They're dimensions of cosmic coherence that operate as very much like the idea of just by analogy, only by analogy, like the idea of the Trinity, right? That in the Christian tradition, their the relatedness of these orders to one another. It's not just the fact that there are these three orders, it's the interrelatedness of the orders Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. creates cosmos, that creates the attunement. It's not just three individual independent things being coalesced, right? It's the interlocking nature of the orders and the presence of each of them in the others that creates the fundamental attunement. And of course, you'll know from John's series, as part of the argument that the orders have, you know, they're not in good shape, I guess you could say. Well, so, that's so the, interesting. The, right? not if, being... Go ahead, go ahead, please, Robert. No, if they're real, if they're these are like uh, caves to explore, or or like you know uh, places to mine or places to consider, um, and and if I, my narrative is out of whack or my conceptual structure and the the ideas I'm operating with and under is uh, like a paucity, right? Uh, and I have a disheveled uh, moral understanding of the universe or even like a disheveled relationship with like the color green and what sensation means, then, yeah. then these are like, like I, I don't know, like the, the uh, Epictetus might say like, oh, these are three things we could talk about, but they're always one. And so this idea of kind of like parsing out our thoughts in different buckets in order to uh, use them and find them beautiful and and move in new directions, right, is is kind of the purpose yeah. of a lot of that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, to, to bring that back to John for a second, yeah. you know, the, 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 I, this idea that what was once, I don't mean to paint an overly nostalgic view of the past, but you know, I'm not to say not to say that it was without suffering. In fact, in many ways, the suffering was greater. And perhaps there's a connection between the fact that the suffering was in many ways greater and the attunement to wisdom and the sacred was greater, because there's a connection between those two. Yeah, through suffering we learn, a teacher used to say. That's right. That's right. And you know, part of the 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 efficacy of agape in the way that John teaches it is as a as a transformative power that converts suffering and and from within suffering produces renewal and birth right i mean that's not john's idea that's one of the fundamental tenets of the 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 christian project and 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 arguably the platonic and neoplatonic project to some degree before it but john has a way of, of pronouncing that in ways that make it intelligible to people, right? I remember the first time, you know, he, I remember, the, I still remember very vividly the first lecture on Agape that he gave when I was, I think I was 20 years old in his class and I heard it. And he, and at the time he said, um, he sort of, he was sort of appreciating the irony in the fact, I think he said something like, isn't it funny that a Buddhist atheist is teaching you all about Christian love, you know? And, um, that's the thing that's uncanny about him. Now, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't self-identify as an atheist anymore. There are complicated reasons for that, but, um, but, or, or probably as a Buddhist in the way that he was. When I met him, he was very much a Buddhist. That's the way that he understood himself. And I think that coming back to one of the greatest rediscoveries that he has made that has altered and enriched the course of his thinking since I met him. Is his reacquaintance with Neoplatonic Christianity. Neoplatonic Christianity. I first met him. Buddhism was a much more central tenet of his thinking and orientation. It's still very present, don't get me wrong. 
it's still very influential, but I think it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't hold this, it doesn't, it doesn't sit at the head of the table for him now, the way that it, I think it did when I first met him. But I remember him saying that, isn't it funny that a Buddhist atheist is teaching you all about Christian law? But that was the irony. It was a beautiful irony because, you know, I grew up as a Catholic and, uh, and I had many homilies in my life from, you know, various priests talking about Christian love. And I'd never heard it explained in such a way that made me understand the wisdom in it, as opposed to it being a feeling or a predisposition or an excessive affect of some kind that you sort of mustered with force of will. No, there's a wisdom behind it. And the wisdom comes from how we place our attention and how we use our attention to realize what is most true in the silhouette behind each person. And that is how John taught agape. And because he understood the wisdom in it, right? And, and that, again, comes back to the, that fundamental orientation to wisdom that is singular, right? Many people talk about it, but very few people can actually, can actually help us locate it, you know? And, um, yeah, and that's what he does, you know. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. So this leads into maybe question number four. So what are some barriers to appreciating, understanding, or applying ideas from John's work? <laughs> barriers. Um I don't know. What are some barriers? I... Um I don't know how to come at that question. Let me think. Um, What's preventing people from getting even more out of him or his ideas or his lecture well, series? I, I don't know. I mean, people are getting a lot out of it, clearly. I mean, wh one, one thing is there's just a lot to it. There's a lot there. You know, you, you need to... Um, <laughs> John is always overwriting himself. That's what he does, right? John, in that way, in that way, John is a very classical, there, there's a, there's a, I don't think of John in a scholarly capacity very much. I don't think that that's a term that really, um, that um, describes him very well. But there is one, there's, there's something about him that is quite scholarly, which is that he is constantly responding to reposts, to criticisms, to critiques of his arguments. And there's no one that critiques an argument of John's more immediately uh, and with more alacrity than John himself, right? I mean, it's one of the endearingly frustrating things about working with John is that he's constantly adapting and changing his arguments. He's constantly, constantly filling in gaps. He's constantly, not filling in gaps, that's not the right way of putting it, but he's constantly, he's constantly adjusting and restructuring his arguments, right? Um, you know, and, and the typologies therein and, and, and bringing in new, I mean, John, he reads voraciously, he digests the thought of other people very voraciously. And so I think one of the things that people find so challenging about John is the fact that John is capacious and that, that capaciousness informs the way that he presents ideas. He's making gestures in this direction, right? He gestures over to psychology, he gestures to cogsci, he gestures to philosophy, to linguistics, to you know classical philosophy. He's constantly, constantly bringing things in from other disciplines and he's constantly fanning his thinking out to other disciplines. He's eclectic without being chaotic, right? And uh, he's eclectic, but synthetic, right? Or synoptic is what you would call it in the, in the context of Cogsci, especially, right? Synoptic integration, which is that there's a multidisciplinary, there, 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 he, he is, he's roaming along a spectrum of disciplines, but the purpose, his purpose is not to be interdisciplinary. He's not doing it for its own sake. He's not trying to be eclectic. He's simply trying to fan his awareness out as far and wide as possible to be able to gather convergent impressions and arguments from different domains of thinking to stereoscope perspectives together to be as comprehensive as he could possibly be. And like I said, there's a cost to that, right? And I think 
there is so much packed in tightly and densely into his lectures that you could take every last reference and you could follow it along on a tangent, you know? So and I guess what I'm trying to say is John accumulates a very extensive bibliography in his lectures, in his courses, in his conversations. He makes sidelong references this way and that way. And that can be very that can be very intimidating to people because nobody, and I do mean it, nobody has read as much as John has. He just has, that's just how he is. He has that gift. Um, and I do mean it. I've never ever met somebody who has, um, who has submerged himself as extensively as John has into as many domains that are relevant to his vocation. And um, I don't mean like he read books about gardening or something, but you know, things that are relevant to him, things that are relevant to what he's doing. And because of that, his scope of citation and his scope of reference is really extensive. And he does not try to diminish it. And he does not try to abbreviate it for the sake of brevity or to make people feel better. He wants to include the full scope of what is relevant to his work. And so I would say that the, um, the extensiveness of his frame of reference is very challenging to people because, because it's liable to be distracting, but it can also be very fruitful, right? People acquire secondary or vicarious information through John a lot of the time, right? Because he introduces them to a thinker that they've never heard before, or he puts them onto a book that they've never, you know, read. And so they follow him into, he, he becomes sort of a nexus point that feeds out again into all of these other people and thinkers and disciplines that are all being channeled through his arguments, right? Again, it's this integrative synthesizing capacity that he has that is both probably the, the most direct reason for his success as a thinker, but that is also probably the greatest challenge to people who are trying to follow him. He's caught like he's he's like he's like the Heracliton River, like he's constantly flowing. And there is a logo, there's a central logos that maintains the consistency of that entity. Don't get me wrong, right? I don't mean to say that he's all becoming and no being or anything like that. That's not it, right? There's a central logos, there's a thrust that that he. Let me put it this way, it's very fair claim to say. John stays the same. John remains John by changing constantly. John remains John by changing constantly. He's constantly adapting himself in the direction of novelty, in the direction of what was not conscious to him before. And so John is always coming, John is always coming into awareness of himself. He's constantly coming into awareness of a fuller, more articulated version of the argument that has existed within him all of this time and that he keeps chipping away at like it's the marble sculpture that he's just, you know, like that Plotinus metaphor of just constantly chipping away at the marble until you pronounce the form within it. John is constantly chipping away at himself and his work to bring about the most definitive version of the integrative whole of the perspective that he's trying to bring on the project of wisdom. And it's a project that never ends. And the thing about John is that he understands that, it's, that it is without end. He understands it to be an infinite project. And he understands that the infinite nature of that project exceeds him as a person. John is someone who's deeply, deeply aware of his finitude. That's another thing that characterizes John that separates him out. There's a humility about John that is born from a deep and very visceral awareness of his limitation as a person, his finitude as a man, his mortality as a man. I mean, again, right, that this is something that people caught into in his lectures and his thinking. The, 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 the you know, the idea of fatalism, right, that, that that's the stoic part of John in, in a technical way, right? John is deeply, 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 um, John harbors a presence of the fatalistic within him. He, are, uh, he, he, he has, you know, there's, a, there's, there's something, even though he's capacious, even though he, his, his scope of sight is far, 
there is a deep and abiding modesty and a really powerful vulnerability to his character. And that vulnerability, his, his capacity to be impressed, struck by beauty, struck by pain, struck by, by the vicissitudes of his own project. His, his, he is impressionable even while he is rigorous and formidable and capacious as he is. And it is that combination that makes him as a character singular and it is a profoundly Socratic trait. Right, it is a profoundly Socratic trait, right? And that's appropriate. John is, a, John is a, a student of Socrates before and beyond anything else. I think that's what he would say of himself. So all of that seems uh, fitting enough. I've completely lost the thread of your question, Robert. That's oh, great, okay. yeah, no, that was like a, like a poem in service of, of greatness or something like that. That was, that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I can hear like how much you care about him um because it's funny because like I can perceive you as a very serious person like you're really taking both the question and what you're saying very seriously but like underneath all that seriousness you can really just feel um like the loyalty of a friend or something like that oh yeah I mean I love him I, he's he's a very 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 dear friend we, we, the, uh, you know my relationship with him passed out of out of long time ago passed out of the sort of student teacher relationship into a genuine reciprocal friendship that's 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 been true for a long time now so um i john for me is first and foremost a, a friend and and that's why i understand that you know i also feel a little bit protective of it because um john john's host to a lot of projections and i'm not excluding myself in that you know i projected onto him too we all we people do that a lot because well, because he is everything that he is. Um, and because he's everything that he is, everything that we've just been talking about, everything I've been describing, people people pin a lot of things on him. They pin a lot of aspiration onto him. They pin mm. a lot of hope on him. They pin a lot of expectation onto him. Mm. Everyone wants to be with him in his time. Everyone wants to work with him. And because he's generous and he's genuinely interested in the novelty of, of, of yet unacquired wisdom, he will spread himself as thinly as he can manage in order to interface with as many people as possible and to interact meaningfully with as many people as possible. Um, but that also means that, you know, uh, he, uh, he, he, that also means that people expect a lot from me. And I think that, um, and and because because John has the has a vulnerable dimension to his personality, that makes him um, more galvanizing as a pedagogue. That same trait of vulnerability also exposes him to to you know um, to like I said to a lot of unconscious projections from other people. I think people make him into a lot of you know a lot of people. A lot of, I mean, it happens to anybody that achieves a certain amount of notoriety for their ideas, right? People, people foist their own projects, their own ambitions. Yeah, but John doesn't have, seek just, uh, that attention. That's, I think, a big difference. No. Most people that would get to that point to have that kind of uh, uh, part of society attracted to you, that part of people coming out around you, um, most people want that. They're they're happy to be up in that tower. Um, so to speak, but right, but, right. But John's not John, a, a seeking that he's seeking like information well, about transformation. He likes helping people. He likes all these just things that happen. And now he's just, I would say, right place, right time, right? Like he just happens to be a voice for something that people want a voice for. I think so. I think, I mean, I think John is best understood as a teacher. And, um, and I, I think that's what John wants to do. I think he wants to be, he's a, he's, He's a teacher. He's a teach. He's a teacher in the Socratic tradition, you know. And he, he would not style himself as a guru. I mean, he has sagacious qualities. There's no doubt about that. Um, well, John let's talk about his ideas, himself. so we don't glorify him too much. Then let's uh, well, or go ahead. Another yeah. point that you want to add. But, but again, the, but again, the, the, 
but it's impossible to separate the two, right? That's the problem. That is both, that's both the virtue and the vice of being in that position. Because the thing that attracts people to John is that he manifests in character what he teaches, which is this Socratic orientation to the truth, truth not as a matter of, of propositional pedantry, um, but as a matter of, of, of fundamental disposition towards what is most real and good uh, that, is, that, that is available to our contemplation. And, um, and you, can't, you can't teach that adequately. Again, I'm thinking about Socrates here. You can't teach that adequately un unless you somehow incarnate it. And, that, and that's why, you know, that's why people who are, are great teachers of these traditions, um, and that's all, obviously not all he teaches or all he does, but people who are great teachers in that traditions are, would play host to a lot of things from a lot of people who, who want them to be this way or that, to be this way or that. And, um, and uh, um, so, you know, that, that kind of challenge, I mean, that going back to your previous question, I think it's relevant, right? One of the challenges uh, that people experience when they're trying to understand John is that they have to understand themselves to understand John, meaning that they have to pretend a lot of what they've, a lot of what they've foisted on what they're seeing in order to dialogue with it properly. The thing that John does is he, is that John's, John's um, teaching puts people into the position where they dialogue with themselves. Because again, there's this sort of a recollective sense of coming into contact with and communing um, suspicions or apprehensions that you already had that had never been fully, had given adequate voice. So one thing is, you know, kind of, like any great teacher, they force you to contend with your, your, your axiomatic ways of thinking, to challenge them, to, you know, to, to force you back on your heels a little bit and, um, and, and turn you in the direction of yourself, turn you into the direction of your own presuppositions. And that's not always comfortable for people, you know, and, uh, but it's so intrinsically meaningful as a project that uh, keeps people coming back. Excellent. So um, next question is, uh, what does he mean by cultural cognitive grammar? Are there any tools or resources you can imagine helpful to yourself or someone else in understanding this more or applying this idea to your life more? Oh, boy. Um, what does he mean by cultural cognitive grammar? Well, Usually when he uses that term, he's referring to the way that the world and ourselves, right? The way that conscious experience writ large presents itself as meaningful, right? Um, the how of the how of the presentation, right? The the symbolic language, right? I mean, it, and, and he, uses, he uses that term to refer, I think, to the structures of meaning within our phenomenological experience, within what he might call our salience landscape or significance landscape, that determine how our attention is directed unto the world and what we acquire from it. In other words, how our relationship to the world is constituted, on what bases, under what invisible premises, within what invisible scaffold is our experience and fundamental relation to reality anchored and organized? What are the tenets of that organization? What are the invisible structures of the world, not the physical structures, but those invisible structures that organize the presentation of our experience and elude its meaning to us in such a way that we are then possessed 
of the capacity to act upon. How does the world elude itself to us? And what prescriptions does it give to act upon it? That, the structures that determine that relationship is what he means by cultural cognitive grammar. And he uses both terms because, because he understands it to, he understands the createdness of experience not to be a property of me, not to be a property simply of my cognition, not to be simply a property of the cultural constraints created and represented to me, but a, but a, but a reciprocal flowing relationship that is mutually constituted by the way in which they relate to one another. Um, and, um, and, and again, you can see these as orders of emergence or of emanation as the case may be, he would probably say both. Um, and uh, he's had a lot of conversations, especially with Greg, I think, Henriquez about, about, about those levels that um, probably adds a little bit more, um, adds a little bit more texture to that. But yes, that's fundamentally what he means by the, 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 the cultural cognitive grammar is the, the, the language, the, in, the sort of the unspeakable, invisible language, unspeakable, not insofar as we can't speak about it, but insofar as it's, it's fundamentally, its intelligibility exceeds our capacity to speak about it. That's what I mean by unspeakable. The unspeakable language that constitutes the meaning of the world as it presents to us, and the meaning of that world entails and includes the meaning of oneself to oneself. And, to others. and that's why collective intelligence is part of like the solution to that problem is that it gets more minds together to grapple with this massively complex part of phenomenon law, like part of life. Yeah, I think that from John's perspective, I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Is that that's, fair to you I mean, too? John, or how do you feel about collective intelligence? Is that something you're as uh, passionate as he is or 